Welcome back to another episode of Six Picks Music Club, a music podcast for people who cannot believe that Kurt Loader is 78 years old. All right, all right. Welcome back to another episode of Six Picks Music Club, a music podcast where we make some jokes and we talk about six songs around a central theme. So this week is going to be a lot of fun. We've got a, a good episode for you today. What we are looking at for this episode are some of our favorite festival finds. Down here in Austin, Texas, we've got South by Southwest coming up in literally fewer days than you have toes and fingers. And we thought we would spend today's episode talking about some of our favorite festival finds, bands that we saw for the first time at a music fest of some sort or other, just to get everybody's brain in that gear going, because music fests are some of my favorite weekends and weeks to spend exploring and discovering new music. But before we get too far down the road, we got to get the doors open. We got to unlock the clubhouse. What's the password this week, guys? Open up, meat sneakers. (laughs) (laughs) Meat sneakers. All right, let's lace them up and get the doors open and everybody come on in. All right, welcome back. Here we are in our humble clubhouse. It's getting a little bit bigger. We have a new chaise lounge, courtesy of the Wet Leg Girls. Thank you, girls. We do love it. That was really nice of them to send us furniture uh, just for briefly talking about their music. It's really cool. Yeah, so before we get into our topic, I thought I would do just a real quick kind of rundown and give you a little background on on South by Southwest, what it means. It's this week of craziness that happens in Austin every spring break, basically. It's so funny because all of the public schools have now aligned their holidays to coincide with South by Southwest because they just know that <laughs> it's going to be a shit show and nobody would come to school if they didn't do that, so... It's pretty fun. But it started back in 1987. Lewis Myers and Roland Swenson, along with the Red River Music venue owner, Lewis Black, they uh, envisioned this this showcase of ice. Let's take a walk back into history. (laughs) So, yeah, the first one only had 177 artists and 15 stages. Only? Only 700 people came to the first one, which is nuts because... That's like a guest to artist ratio of six to one. That's wild, right? That's a lot of artists' availability there. In 94, they added this film and interactive tracks. So it's kind of a multifaceted festival now. And uh, that was a big year because Johnny Cash delivered the the keynote performance Ooh. and uh, put South by on the, on the map there. These days, the 700 attendees is maybe who you will have in the convention center at any one time. But it is thousands and thousands of people. I think they estimate between 250 and 400,000 people come to town just for this festival. It's huge. Beyond the official showcases of South by Southwest, there's a whole microcosm of unofficial showcases that happen that are free shows where breweries will give out free beer or tacos or whatever, and just to bring people in the building and bands will just come and play. So Wherever you go, any bar turns into a venue. And you think there's like a lot of demo passing and meat sneaking going on? (laughs) (laughs) You're really on this meat sneaking thing. It's great. (laughs) I can't quit it. I'm going to be sneaking meats for a while. That's okay. That's okay. Canadian carnivores, that all makes sense to me. Just sneak your meat wherever you need to Mm -hmm. take it. If it's in a movie theater, put it in your pocket and then pocket pull that meat sneaker right Mm. on out when you're Mm. ready for it. I actually have a song on my list from a South By that I went to, but we also have some other festivals we're going to talk about today. You look back at Woodstock being one of the very original kind of music fests that have then evolved into your Lollapaloozas, your Bonnaroos, your ACL music fests. And and now it's like there's not a weekend from middle of April until end of October that doesn't have a festival somewhere on some beach or some bayou or wherever. It's like, how do we get 120 bands together over three days and then get 70,000 people in in a space and and sell them all $12 beers. I think what I like about music festivals is that they're so freewheeling. Yeah, you're going to spend a tremendous amount of money. Yeah, you got to keep up with your bracelet. Yeah, you know, if you get bad weather, it's going to be 
a real humdinger out there. Going to get real messy. <laughs> Maybe, you know, you're going to get your hands on some drugs that you shouldn't be taking at 12 noon when it's 105 degrees outside. Maybe you're going to overheat a little bit and forget to hydrate. <laughs> Maybe you're going to buy a whole bottle of wine that they serve you in a plastic <laughs> bottle that you would normally carry with you while you're on a bicycle and instead of drinking any water or even beer you just drink a whole water bottle full of wine maybe you do that mistakes were made yeah mistakes <laughs> do get made but and then maybe you decide to take a nap at an area there isn't anybody when you wake up there's a fucking show happening around you and you're like <laughs> yeah. what the fuck is going on and people yeah. are stepping on you. And, There's yeah. a show happening. Yeah. The, the cool thing about the music festival to me is that everybody's in. Everybody's around. There's so many people. It's a sea of folks. There's stuff to do before. There's stuff to do after the gates close. And it's such a long day and series of days that you have... If something bad befalls you or you miss out on something, you can recover. There's more to do. You could drink your water and get back on it. Like, whereas if you're doing a regular concert that's two hours long, if you take the wrong pill, you know, you're just on the moon and you miss the whole thing. Not at a music festival. You can sneak. You can duck and dive. You can see Robert Randolph play instead of watching Vampire Weekend. Uh, you can do all kinds of different stuff. And especially when it's nighttime, you can find nooks and crannies in this wide open space. Man, I love that about music festivals. Everybody's in, and there's lots of adventure. Bobby, our friend who you'll meet next week when he guest spots on the pod, and I, in 2005, were at Austin City Limits, and one night it was closed by Widespread Panic, who I'd never seen before, and we were on a variety of substances, probably like a water bottle full of wine, plus <laughs> various forms of mind-altering substances, but just loving it, dude. And that night I was like, man, widespread panic absolutely rules. I've never listened to them since, if I'm being honest. <laughs> but that night they were everything that I needed. And then we were just in like that gooey, everything was funny stage. We're walking out. Uh, we're walking down by Zilker Park. I remember him doing a bit and I was really laughing hard. because I think I probably had my shirt off and this was back when I was like actually shaving around my nips, which was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but I was doing that back then. I'm sorry, just around your nips, but the rest of it was still hairy? Yeah, I'd kind of leave like the other chest hair because I didn't want to go totally bare. But it was just I, I found the nip hair to be like a little ridiculous back then. But now since it's filled in a bit more, it feels right. But it didn't feel right at age, I guess I was like 22 or 23. <laughs> anyway, it's just a little backdrop on the old uh, Jeff chest. <laughs> But we were walking, <laughs> doing bits, laughing and gooey. And these two women ride up on like BMX bikes. And they're both like, hey, do you guys want to come over and come to a party? And I kind of looked at Bobby. I was like, is this a trick? Are we being tricked? And he was like, hell yeah, dude, that sounds great. <laughs> and they're like, you guys just seem like you're having fun. And that's all we're trying to do at our place. And I was like, yeah, I mean, of course. And so immediately I switched from drug widespread panic zone to getting laid brain. You know, I just immediately go, as my friend Kyle said, come headed on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this could be, this could turn out really interesting. There's two of them. There's two of us. Maybe they have two rooms. Things could be great. And so we, we go to their place. It's not their house. It's an apartment that's very close to Zilker Park. And it's not really just like a chill party. It's a big party that is string cheese incident themed. The band string cheese incident, which is a jam band and people get really into them and people that are really into them have butterfly cutouts that are like wings that they wear and jellyfish that they've made that have lights on them. And that's the kind of party that it was. And Bobby and I immediately got inserted into that after being like, are we going to get some action tonight to we're just in string cheese incident party? <laughs> and dude, if we did not have the best fucking time at that party, man, at first there was always like a part of me that thought we were getting made fun of because we were so gooey, but they were just really nice, 
folks there and they were just really into that band. And so we were like, I guess we'll check it out. And then like fast forward, the sun's coming up. It's seven in the morning. We stayed there all night long. And then we emerged from it. I remember the sun hitting me and I was like, ah, (laughs) because we had to like get ready for the next day of the festival, which was in like five hours. But what a great problem to have. I'm glad we ran into those girls, but it was just a real lovey, good feeling time. But that's the kind of thing that you look back on and you're like, I just don't get enough of that in my life. Like how many opportunities more am I going to have where I'm just wandering? When I lived in Houston, my wife and I were hanging out with our old buddy from college, Thomas, because he lived there and we just happened to bump into him. And so we were hanging out. We were at a bar or something. Some people invited us over and I was like, okay. And he was like, I don't know. I don't think it's a good idea. And I thought, ah, it should be fine. Let's go. So we ended up going. And it's just these, this guy and this girl, but they look kind of scary. And their house was really scary. And they just sat there and they were like really <laughs> quiet. And it was really uncomfortable. Oh. And we're just like, oh. It was like House of a Thousand Corpses or <laughs> something. something. like I don't know. It was really <laughs> weird. And it was like, something bad's going to happen tonight, I think. Like the whole mood was just shot. And we're like, okay, we got to go somehow. They're like, where are you going? Like, yeah, where no. are you going? We're going to follow. <laughs> was, oh, God, no. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, so I have. I don't know if I've had a, like a random after party that was good. Dude, that is the polar opposite of my <laughs> yes. story. I mean, it really, it truly is. It's like on the spectrum of stories, <laughs> mine is like, hey, it's all going to be fine and people are good. Yours is like, no, it's not. <laughs> In fact, we're going to get rolled up by some meth heads. <laughs> it was kind of methy feeling. So I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, this is not cool. Then there were a few years where my wife and I lived really close to Zilker Park. And our house was the sort of after party thing for, for you know, Jeff. and It was the HQ. We would all just stay there. Dude, it was so great. It was good times, man. I always love festival season, and I always look forward to it. And it's everything from seeing people that you don't get to see every day, your friends, as well as bands. I think one of the great things about it is that, yeah, there are some headliners and people that you know, but there are so many bands that you just you'll happen upon because you went to get a beer and walked past another stage and somebody just captured your attention, caught your eye and like kept you there. It's so fun. So let's slide into uh, our music festival discoveries, bro. I think this track that you've got for us first is it's got a nice sort of warming up space. And then you get right into like, you're walking in the, uh, the festival and kind of finding your bearings and and learning where you are. And and then you're there and that band hits. Take us there, Jeffro. Let's get into it. It's LCD Sound Systems, Dance Yourself Clean off of the 2010 record, This Is Happening. Yeah, it's got so many cool things about it. The first is that, and it's perfect festival song to open with. So it's three minutes, it's kind of quiet, it's beats. And I was like, oh, is this going to be like, you know, kind of a subdued thing. And then it does the drop. And then like, it turns into just a massive five minute dance party. Don't yeah. You wanna be exactly. And, the, and then that scream where it's like, and it's like all breaking down at the same time. And man, that was just such a pump up moment. The rest of the show was great. The rest of the set was excellent. But from that one song, I was like now a lifelong and diehard LCD sound system fan. Something that always gets a little bit under my skin at the festival is like when people are leaving the show that I'm at and they like walk through where my group is standing and like I become the gate. I have to move for people. Yeah. And so that started to happen at the beginning of this set. And I was like, no, we're not doing this. And so I started doing the most obnoxious dancing that I could do <laughs> to just make people say, oh, yeah, no, keep them that's away. the path of least resistance <laughs> over here. I'm going a different direction. <laughs> so I was like, you can come at me, bro, but I am going to like get in your face and dance at you. Yeah, I'm going to dance like knees like a newborn horse all <laughs> over you. And I'm sweaty, dude. I am schwitzing hard. I think like one of the other things that I loved about that show is just the timing of it because it was just early evening. And I think there is something that is really special about that between 
4.30 and 6.30 time slot where you just start to get the golden hour, you start to get the sunset and you start to see the dust coming and the timing of that LCD sound system show is, was so clutch because you're getting ready to go and it's awesome. My first pick is going to be from the ACL two years prior to that in a similar time slot at 4.30 on Friday afternoon, just as everybody's getting off work, everybody's getting into the park, a band came on stage and rocked my socks off. And that band was Gogo Bordello. And the song is Wanderlust King. I love that song. It's a great song. My gosh. And so this was the first time I'd ever seen them play. And very similarly, I was immediately hooked. I was immediately drawn in and said, holy shit, what are we doing here? This is amazing. So this is a band and they've been around for 10 years at the point that I first come into festival contact with them. They're this gypsy punk band from Lower East Side of Manhattan formed in 1999. And I was a little bit aware of them because Elijah Wood did this movie called Everything's Illuminated and the singer of Gogo Bordello, Eugene Hutz, he's in the movie too and he contributes songs to it. And so I was aware of it and I was working with this dude, Beto, and he was very much a like a world music dude. He took me to a Femi Kuti concert and like Los Amigos Invisibles is another band that he got me into. And of course, Devochka with their Little Miss Sunshine soundtrack in 2006. It was all in that same space that I became aware of Gogo Bordello, but I'd never really listened to them. I'd never really seen them play a show before. And they came on at 4.30 on Friday afternoon. It's the perfect slot. You have that first beer, and then this band comes out and grabs you by the testicles and tells you which way you're going. And that's right to the party. And so it's wild because this is the only single that came off of that record from 2008. They released earlier that year called Super Taranta. They didn't do a bunch of singles because they wanted to promote the whole record as this concept, which is this hybrid of gypsy punk with Toronto, which is like a traditional Italian folk music. And so it's that kind of pairing. And this song is everything that I think we lose in this sort of world of America where we don't ever leave the state we live in and we don't ever leave the country by God. And we just we're always stuck with our singular perspective. And we think that's the only thing there is. And to me, this song talks about exploring the world, man wouldn't be considered a man until he crossed the seven seas. And I think there's a lot of value to get out of your comfort zone and explore and rebel and break down boundaries. And this whole song was perfect for that time in my life where we're dealing with all the defiance of nonconformity and, and, and rejecting societal norms and all that stuff. You can't help but get fired up by it. And the whole band, it's just, it's so frenetic, so much energy. Their live show is, is, is out of control. Yeah, and Eugene's up there just drinking bottles of red wine while they party a bottle of wine yeah <laughs> not in a plastic sippy cup <laughs> elizabeth sons dancing all over the place and there's so much cool stuff and sergey he's just like this older gray-haired gray-bearded pirate looking dude just like giving the sexiest glares to the audience as he's got one foot up on a monitor <laughs> <laughs> just like, ha! <laughs> yeah, he wears a vest and no shirt under it. It's just bare chest with vest. I think uh, my my wife questioned whether or not we were actually going to get married <laughs> after we saw that band, but uh, we did. I think I was at that show with that that same show with you. I remember because that was my that was my very first experience with them. I just forgotten about them, and then it was really fun to hear it again. I was like, holy shit, Gypsy Punk. <laughs> like, I got to go back through this, man. No, it's awesome. They have another track that I love. It's called American Wedding, where he talks all about how, like, have you ever been to American Wedding? Where's the vodka? Where's the marinated herring? <laughs> Where's the band that's going to play all night? You know, it's just like, just throwing uh, shade at uh, Americans and their weddings, and they just like, they end, and it's, oh, he's got, she's got a boyfriend, and it's, it's got to be yeah. up early. And... <laughs> but uh, Russ, you've got, I think, an ACL pick as well. Uh, you want to take us through your song? I do. Actually, I have two ACL picks. So my first festival pick is called River by Bishop Briggs. It's off of her 2018 album, Church of Scars, and it was from the 2018 ACL. Bishop Briggs is not her real name, and I can't figure out why she changed it, right? Her real name is Sarah McLaughlin. I don't know. Seems like a legitimate singer's oh, name, right? Yeah, so I mean, it's fine. Yeah, it's a, it's a perfectly <laughs> fine name. And for some reason, when I hear that name, I think of suffering animals. <laughs> right. 
but I don't know why. I think of angels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Angels and suffering animals. <laughs> so she's Scottish and she grew up in a small town in the greater Glasgow area called Bishop Briggs. So that's where her name comes from. I thought it wasn't Bishop also her nickname. Wasn't that the nickname her grandma gave her? Let me just check my index cards. Oh, yeah. Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That year, one of the headliners in ACL was Paul McCartney. Do you remember, Dave? Because we were there together for that one. Totally. I wasn't necessarily looking forward to that show, but it was actually pretty great. So I'm glad. I just thought it was going to be like old man playing guitar and... He had some pretty good stories. It was fun. He played for like three hours. It turned out to be incredible, but I, I had zero expectations. So yeah, it was cool. he crushed it. Anyway, at this point, I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and I think going to ACL was last minute for us. I don't feel like it was planned. It just kind of happened. Um, and so I was like 100% unprepared of like who was playing and what was going on. And I think we only went for that Saturday. And uh, and so it was like one in the afternoon, and my wife and I are just, we're making the rounds. Just I'm looking for something, you know, like. Sure. And we ended up stopping at Bishop Briggs, who was, I think, virtually unknown at that time. I definitely didn't know who she was. And there was, you know, there was a small crowd in front, but nothing much on the one o'clock on a Saturday, you know, what kind of crowd you're going to get. And she is just bouncing all over stage, just going crazy, putting on this electrifying show. There's just so much energy. It was insane. I was like, okay, well, I, I got to see this. And as I'm watching her, I'm just like sweating and I'm thinking, how fucking sweaty is she getting? Like, she's just running back and forth. It was insane. She wanted to be there and she wanted people to watch her and I and I wanted her to be there too. So I said, okay, we're going to, we'll stay and we'll watch. And it turned out to be pretty great. Anyway, so she plays this song River and we're just captivated. River is a song about wanting to get fucked hard. So the relationship <laughs> is probably shaky she doesn't want to ruin it with too much talking so shut up and run me like a river that sounds pretty good you don't think it's about fucking dave dave's not sure if this is about fucking i was wondering what run me like a river means it's... i thought it was about some some people <laughs> with a raft i thought it was a rafting song so her music is a cool blend of pop alt rock and soul she's got pipes on her too just like really powerful and soulful oh yeah in 2018 after that show she ended up shaving all of her head in solidarity for a friend who was diagnosed with breast cancer and then she ended up keeping the look for two years and then in 2020, she started growing it back. And then she came out and said that her sister, Kate, this is a quote from her. She says, my sister, Kate, was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and shaved her head. And I asked her if she wanted me to shave my head with her. And she was like, no, you've grown your little hairs. You've worked so hard. So just leave it. It's fine. So I didn't shave my head, she says. And then a few days later, her sister dies. So she says, now, like, I'll never shave my head again, because if I look in the mirror, we look so similar. It'll just make me miss her, which is kind of dark. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Down. Down hey, there. and uh and right after that, let's talk about St. Jude's, guys. <laughs> <laughs> St. Jude's. <laughs> anyway, her sister's death didn't stop her, and she's still going strong. And, and you know, as an artist, you can tell she just wants to be there, and, and she wants to be doing what she's doing, which is great. She's constantly interacting with her fans and always seems grateful that she can live out her dream. And I think still gives it her all in every performance. In 2022, she played Coachella, and right before she went on, she ended up letting everyone know that she was pregnant in her third trimester. And then she just was bouncing all over the stage and doing the same thing, just like, Totally pregnant as well. Nice. Wow. Yeah. So it's like you got to, I, I think you appreciate the artist for the commitment. Anyway, I guess her husband ran her like a river. So <laughs> as we've discussed the link before, <laughs> that's where babies come from. Yeah. That's where they come from. Yeah. She was on the Masked Singer show. <laughs> Did you hear about this? No. Last season, she won. She won the Masked Singer. And it's a show that, that my, my wife and, and children love to watch. And I have a little bit of a problem just because it's like the end of every episode, they reveal who one of the singers are and everybody starts screaming at the contestant, take it off, take it <laughs> off. And so like my two beautiful daughters are just like in the living room yelling, take it off at the TV. <laughs> and it feels too weird. It feels too weird. But anyway, she won this last season. She played Medusa and, and really blew everybody away. So got some real pipes for sure. And she sings live. Cool. You can tell. Yeah. That was a fun year. I remember that was one of the first years that we didn't opt for the three-day pass. We're just like, well, we're just going to go one day. And and we went the one day and it was perfect. It was like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, it was it was good. It was good. Yeah, those Sundays are tough sometimes, especially during the, the mud one, the, the mud one with Pearl Jam. Dude, dude. Yeah, day three. Okay, 
So I'm going back to the 2010 ACL festival where LCD sound system played. And uh, my second pick tonight is by the Gaslight Anthem from their sophomore album, The 59 Sound. This is Even Cowgirls Get the Blues. There was like three years that we came and did ACL together, right? Around that time. It was like 08, 09, and maybe this one. I don't remember if this was the last one or when Pearl Jam was the last one, I think. It was this year that I started going through the schedule and listening to every single band that was playing and the entire schedule to kind of figure out where I wanted to be and who I wanted, who to, you see. wanted to see. Yeah. Quick aside. A few years later, when we lived in Houston, sorry, I'm just jumping ahead real quick, but it, it, it made me think of this. My wife heard that Gaslight was playing because we had already seen him as, at uh, ACL and uh, they're playing at the House of Blues. But I guess they're having trouble selling tickets. And so they were selling them for $8 a pop. So she bought them and I was like, OK, that's cool. Anyway, um, they were opening for another band that I had never heard of at the time rise against yeah you love those guys so my goal when preparing to go to a show these days is i want to enjoy a show especially if i'm going to see a band i don't know and so i will go back at least a month and like check every set list and like build a playlist with every song they play and just like get really familiar with it so when i go i can just like know every song i started doing that at that show which is cool but it kind of it's what opened up the doors so before you go to every show you do your research yeah <laughs> yes yeah he's very well researched right i am i am researched but at that time i think i was in like a musical rut you know i was like listening to the same stuff i listened to when i was younger and like i just never really branched out i couldn't i just i, I got stuck and so for whatever reason, Rise Against kind of helped open the doors for that. And so um, I guess because I, I dove really deep into a band I never heard of and then I went and saw them live and it was amazing and just kind of opened up my world in a different way. And so I will always thank the Gaslight Anthem for that because I feel like I wouldn't be on this pod with you guys. And if I were, it'd only be shit that was playing on the radio from 20 years ago. So, Which is like my picks? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying at all. No, that's the, that's the sub- fucking text of what you said bro you're terrible at subtext we know this oh yeah <laughs> yeah right oh yeah i'm not good at subtext it's not a cum segment <laughs> oh right yeah i don't okay sorry i totally misunderstood <laughs> all right the front man for gaslight brian fallon writes poetic lyrics and alludes to all kinds of things if you're not paying attention you can miss a ton of what he's actually trying to say but it's kind of cool because the surface level lyrics work too he'll mention little eden which is springsteen right off of that july 4th Ashbury Park song. And then in the same song, he's got But Not Me Pretty Baby, which is kind of a homage to Tom Petty's You're So Bad. All right. So it starts off and he's talking about his friends trading in the fun life for getting married and having babies. We get to the first chorus and he sings how he loves listening to Tom Petty songs and driving old men crazy and that he doesn't intend to slow down while Little Eden is waiting, which is the boardwalk at Ashbury Park where, you know, you go to have fun. Is it made of boards? <laughs> it probably is, right? Is it on the beach? I think so. Yeah, you know what? I'm from Texas. I We don't have fucking boardwalks here, so I don't know. Do you have boardwalks in Canada? Not that I'm aware of. There's a pier. We have, pier. We have piers. Yeah, so I don't know. Maybe somebody from New Jersey will let us know. The native sons of Springsteen. I love the variation of the chorus throughout. I, I feel like there's a, a lot of heart and soul coming through there. And in the last one, there's this guitar feedback for a few seconds before the drums kick in and then he just starts wailing. It just gets me every time. That's awesome. Did I ever tell you that Brian Fallon's in our podcast network? I have heard that. You know, one of, one of our favorite podcasts is Bandsplain, which is... That's right, that's right. ...recorded by Yazi Salik, and he's friends with Yazi Salik. Basically, he's in our network, is my point. Yeah, we've listened to his friend's podcast. We're basically the same. Yeah, and we have absolutely no connection with her whatsoever, <laughs> but... But you don't know anybody. You just listen to him. I've listened to <laughs> scores of hours of her in my ear holes, and she's friends with this guy. So I, f I think that we're in the same network. Yep. Yeah. I don't, however, understand the title. I thought that it was a song written from the perspective of a woman and like she was the narrator was the cowgirl. Oh, that's good. I think you got it. But maybe I missed it. Damn. Good call, dude. I don't know. It's just kind of how I heard it. I heard it the reverse cowgirl. <laughs> But yeah, driving old men crazy. I, I thought that's kind of like where where I got that it was 
was a lady. Oh, that's interesting. Wow, yeah, man. I I did. Do you guys still ever do any reverse calc? <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of those it's only for tv that position nobody actually ever does it like i feel like it's a, i feel like it's an option that's on the menu but it's it's not really it's the expensive steak on the menu that you never buy you know it's the one ounce of <laughs> bourbon for 900 dollars. yeah it's kobe beef and you're like i could get it but we're just gonna go for the t-bone burnett instead right like a- <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, I one of the things I, I love about Brian Phelan, friend of the pod. Is it Phelan? Am I saying it wrong? I don't even know. Fallon? Phelan? I don't know. I'm doubling down on Fallon. Fallon. All right, I'll say Fallon. Because I speak English and it has two <laughs> fucking L's in it. <laughs> so yeah, Brian Fallon's real obsessed with the, the thing, the way things sound and, and like he rebuilt the bass amp because he wanted a, like a really fuzzy bass tone for the record and... So he took a new cabinet and then rebuilt it with vintage parts. That's cool. Before they recorded this record. Russ, I'm pretty sure that one time... Well, I, it's so funny, like... Oh, no, you go ahead. Yeah, no, that's fine. It's about amp rebuilds. <laughs> Is that what we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what you're going to say? No, I was going to say, like... No, I uh, just want to do it. I was going to say... It's like, are you doing this on purpose? Or? Yeah, that time I did. Well, that's going to be a great transition into my song, which is next. It's a really beautiful song that I do love dearly, and uh, for a lot of reasons we'll get into in a minute. But um, this is a song from a band that I had a chance to see them at South by Southwest in 2009. And that band is called Blind Pilot, and the song is Three Rounds and a Sound. But yeah, what a pretty song, man. And I think there's a lot of reasons why this was perfect for me at that time that I heard it and discovered this band. I, I think there's a lot of stuff in here lyrically about the nature of unconditional love and sort of that transcendence you can find when you have a person that you will go three rounds with. But this is a band that initially formed in 2004 up in Portland, Oregon by Israel Nebecker and the drummer Ryan Dabrowski. This was the titular song of their debut record. And before they actually released it, they went on this this Pacific Northwest tour where they built and fashioned trailers for their bicycles. And they rode bicycles 1,500 miles to little small towns and played at backyard parties and stuff and really solidified this sound. That's awesome. They had a lot of buzz coming into South by that year. They actually ended up with four different showcases, Submerged, BMI, Pandora, and NPR. And their, their NPR lunch show earned them a, a spot on Prairie Home Companion. And when we saw them, it was like Friday night at 1 a.m. at this unofficial showcase. It was just this really beautiful show. But it is definitely a contrast in the music that you would hear a lot of in that day and age. And so it was kind of a nice thing to end the night with. But it encapsulates a lot of the things that I was feeling at the time as I was entering this transitive moment in my relationship. And it was just really fun getting to to see that band and do the, the South by thing with this woman that I that I ended up marrying and having children with. It was It was special. That's sweet, dude. And there's my wife walking through my podcast studio, a.k.a. our garage. Are you filming me? She's mocking you. <laughs> You're mocking us. <laughs> she can't hear you. She can't hear anything that you're doing. She stuck him in the garage, and now she takes pictures of him. Yeah, watching an animal in a cage. <laughs> so now it's like the zoo. She's put me in the uh, in the garage, and now she's. Ooh, look at my thing I have. Yeah, look at how I've harnessed the power of the leopard. Oh, uh, she's facetiming with her sister. I just said so many sweet things about you. You don't even know. Well, isn't that? Yeah, it's nice that she came in during that. The question is, what would he have really said if she weren't in there? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Christ. You guys kill me. So that's my slow song for the week. And I'll probably have more slow songs in the future. Just here's the thing, dude. If you're going to work me slow, you better work it good. That's all I'm saying. Yes, that is not run you like a river by any means. That is Yeah, run me like a river. Shit, Jeff, can you get us out of here with some energy? What do you got for us next? 2006, I was at Austin City Limits. This show could have very well just have been about Austin Music Festival, which is fine by me. That's what I fucking proposed anyway. <laughs> In 2006, I was, again, hanging out with Bob, and the band Secret Machines came out and played this song off of their 2004 album, Now Here Is Nowhere. It's called First Wave Intact. (laughs) 
You can see why this why this song, though, I think is a good festival song, because any song that just crescendos into hard rocking does well for me at a music festival. Yeah. This is a band that doesn't really have a bass player in it. The lead singer, whose name is Brandon Curtis, is playing the bass part on his keyboard. So the boom, boom. Is all on his keyboard. And then the drummer is just smashing the drums when they play live. He's reaching his arms up in the air and smashing down on them. And he breaks drums and everything, but it creates this like very loud popping rhythm. And uh, it's pretty great. This band is a product of Dallas. They moved to New York. They were the Curtis brothers, Brandon and Benjamin Curtis, and the drummer's name Josh Garza. They immediately flew close to the sun. So they opened for Interpol before supporting Oasis in Europe. And then they went on a co-headlining tour with Kings of Leon in 2005. They're stratospheric right away after their first record. Wow. But then they put out an, a second album, 10 Silver Drops, in 2006, which I like even more than this one. Open for U2 on Three Dates in Mexico, which by all accounts is a thankless job because nobody goes to see the openers. And then they were interviewed on the radio by David Bowie, who is a fan of theirs. And they're even name-checked. In that movie, It Might Get Loud, the documentary that's got Edge and Jack White. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're like, Edge, who are the guitarists you like? And he's like, Benjamin Curtis from Secret Machines. Like, it was all about to happen. And then weirdly, Brother Benjamin, he's the guitarist, and he leaves the band to go work on a side project called School of Seven Bells. Right. Which is like kind of an electronica thing in New York. And then he died of lymphoma in 2013 at age 35. So it looked like they were about to take off and be like one of the next big bands. And then it just didn't happen. They were basically not a band until they came back in 2020 with another album that is awesome. It's called Awake in the Brain Chamber, and it features Phil Carnatz, who is the guitarist for Trippin' Daisy. He's now the guitarist for the band. Anyway, anywho, long story short, Secret Machines, these two albums, and the third album now I, I did listen to a lot during the pandemic. I love 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 the secret machines and i hope more people get to know them well i really thought we were going to get out of the episode without death but you just hit us with the lymphoma man it's just we had to kill somebody off somebody had to die we had two deaths this episode oh yeah there was another death but they both died from cancer yeah it wasn't a drug death so there weren't any fun deaths god yeah no lymphoma is certainly <laughs> not a fun death I'm, I'm <laughs> certain of it no another thing i read was that they worked with director david lynch on the straight to video track that they then used in the inland empire huh film huh. david lynch was also also a fan dude it's wild isn't that wild like for a band that very few people that I know have heard of them. And they had all these like famous people that had their backs and it just didn't happen. Yeah. I want to applaud you for picking two really long songs that held my interest on both. Because normally when you start pushing up to eight, nine minutes and beyond, it's real jam bandy. Yeah. And when people are like, quote unquote, getting lost in the music. Yeah. I'm just getting lost. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. Yeah. But this was good. These are both good. I liked it. Agree. All right, dudes. Well, to our playlist of songs we're freaking amped and hyped for, does anyone got something to add to the fuck you this week? Yeah, dude. Great track called Sometimes by the band Mannequin Pussy. <laughs> oh, okay. Nice. Good. Check it out. It's really good. Heck yeah. I'm in. What about you, Russ? The new Amigo the Devil album came out last week. And there is a song called Once Upon a Time at Texaco. Ah, okay. Finally, dude. Honestly, like, I have just been, like, beside myself. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's still such a dick about it. Oh, my God. Anyway, it's about a robbery that goes wrong, and it's just really fun storytelling, and it ends with this cliffhanger, so it's fun. Uh, it's a good time in a dark way. That's awesome. I'm really into the new Beyonce country song, Texas Hold'em. It's like a real jammer. So that's that's mine. All right. Well, listener, thanks so much for joining us again from 
the great state of Austin, Texas, and the great white north, we say see you next time. It's not a state. <laughs> Austin, Austin, Texas is not a state. It's a fucking city. <laughs> <laughs> you dumbass. <laughs> Keep jamming. Today's episode of Six Picks Music was produced by Hugh Jorgen and edited by Anita Bath. With special thanks, as always, to Dixie Rect. Hugh Jorgen. Ha, 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 